All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We're going to get started in about 30 seconds. We're just going to wait for everyone to come on in from the waiting room. And uh, while we wait for those who are comfortable doing so, uh, feel free in the chat to let us know where you're watching from uh, this afternoon. And we will get started in about 30 seconds. And I'm going to read some of these uh, cities and towns to help pass the time. So again, if you're comfortable doing so, let us know in the chat where you're watching from. Uh, we have folks this afternoon from Greenfield, Sun uh, Sunderland, Waltham, Watertown, Amherst, Haverhill, Gloucester, Dracut, Hingham, Brewster. Uh, we have an out-of-stater, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. All right. Arlington, Northampton, Hingham, Palmer, Worthington, Another East Hampton, Medford, Attleboro, Plymouth, Greenfield, New Bedford, Maynard, Brewster. Wonderful. Well, we're going to proceed with the program, but feel free to continue to um, type your, your cities and towns in the chat if you're comfortable doing so. All right. So my name is Robert Hayes. I'm the Community Outreach Librarian and Head of Technical Services at the Tewksbury Public Library. Want to thank the, well, actually, we've got about 50 or so public libraries partnering with Tewksbury for this National Historic Site Series. Uh, and so we thank them all, uh, including those that are participating today. A uh, couple of logistical notes before we get started. Uh, we're in webinar mode, so Sean and I cannot see or hear the audience. If you have a question for Sean, please type it into the q and If you have a comment for Sean, please type it into the chat. We'll try to address as many comments and questions as we can at the end of the presentation. I anticipate Sean speaking for roughly 40 minutes, and then we'll take roughly 15 minutes of audience questions. Uh, we're going to have to do a hard stop at one o'clock, okay? If there are any questions we don't get to, uh, I will provide you with Sean's email address, and you can uh, email Sean any additional questions. I'm going to give Sean some homework. Um, so you'll all receive an email from me later today with a link to this recording, a link to a feedback survey, and information about some other upcoming virtual programs that may be of interest. Uh, I have uh, enabled the uh, closed caption. Folks have the ability to turn that on or turn that off, uh, whatever they so choose. All right, so let me get to the good stuff and introduce Sean. Uh, so today's uh, program is entitled Boston African American National Historic Site Presents Exploring the Black Heritage Trail. So we're, in, we're enjoying this virtual lunchtime lecture. Uh, the Black Heritage Trail showcases uh, residencies and community buildings associated with a Black community that thrived on and near the north slope of Beacon Hill before, during, and after the American Civil War. Uh, throughout that time, this community struggled and organized for equal rights and access to equal education. Uh, community members championed the movement to abolish slavery and even housed free, uh, freedom seekers on their journey along the Underground Railroad. And so, did, so uh, today's program is led by National Park Ranger Sean Quigley. So all 130 of us watching live, and the hundreds that will watch on demand. Let's give a big virtual round of applause to Sean for joining us today. And Sean, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Robert. Uh, and thank you everyone who is uh, joining here virtually during your lunch hour. Really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, so as Robert said, I am a National Park Ranger uh, working for, as you can see here, the National Parks of Boston. And the National Parks of Boston is uh, really an umbrella term for three of the main national parks uh, that are in the downtown area. So from left to right, you have Boston African American National Historic Site, uh, which we'll definitely be diving into momentarily. In the middle, you have a photograph from Faneuil Hall, which is representative of Boston National Historical Park, uh, which is a park that focuses on the events leading up to the American Revolution and Boston's role within those events, as well as 
uh, the Charlestown Navy Yard and the Battle of Bunker Hill. And on the far right, you have an image from Spectacle Island representing Boston, the Boston Harbor Islands National and State Park, uh, which makes up the 30 plus islands in Boston Harbor um, and a deep exploration of natural and cultural resources on those islands. But as Robert said, and as uh, you are aware by the title, what we're going to be looking at today is a deep dive into Boston's African American community, and more specifically, what is known as the um, Black Heritage Trail. Now, the Black Heritage Trail is, as you can see by this map, it is uh, off of the Freedom Trail, and it is a 90-minute walking tour that uh, goes into the north slope of Beacon Hill and explores the history of Boston's free African-American community that lived in that neighborhood, uh, really from the late 1700s to the end of the American Civil War. Now, that community was relatively small. In fact, if you actually look at the 1860 census here in Massachusetts, you have roughly 2,200 African-Americans living in Boston during that time period, um, which is only about one and a half percent of the city's entire population. But that small size does not diminish importance because this community was crucial and instrumental in leading a social revolution here in the United States. It was a revolution that was felt locally in the form of one of the United States' first two civil rights movements, as well as nationally in the fight against the institution of slavery. Now, these two, two stories really do come together um, as you explore uh, that Black Heritage Trail walking tour, explore the stories of the men and women who lived in this neighborhood. So what we're gonna do now over the next roughly 30 minutes is a bit more of a deep dive into some of the sites that you would see if you were to visit the trail. Um, I'll go into a little bit more detail about how you can do that, uh, you know, as we get in, into the warmer months uh, at the end of this presentation. So I want to begin this story at one of the first stops on the trail which is known as the Phillips School. Now, this is a photograph of the building as it currently stands today. It is private residences, but had you been here in the 1800s, you would have seen a school. Uh, now, this was an all-white school, and Boston schools during this time period were segregated. Now, what this is an example of is what this free African-American community is facing. Because although it is a free community in the early 1800s, it is not an equal community in the eyes of many Bostonians. And the roots of that inequality can be found within the institution of slavery. Not slavery in the southern United States, but slavery right here in Massachusetts. Massachusetts, like all of the 13 original colonies, enslaved people. Slavery existed in Massachusetts all the way through the American Revolution itself. So although slavery was abolished by the time that that community, that African-American community is settling on the North Slope of Beacon Hill, that legacy of slavery was something still very much in Massachusetts culture, resurfacing through racial discrimination and segregation, which existed not only in education, but transportation, railroads, where you worked, where you lived, where you ate. All walks of life, men and women living in that North Slope of Beacon Hill community, face treatment as second-class citizens. But this is a community that sees themselves as true inheritors of the legacy of the American Revolution, a community that is going to push back against injustice. And one of the key fights amongst this social revolution, this civil rights movement, if you will, in the early 19th century, is this fight over education. And what you're looking at here is an image of the Abiel Smith School. Now, the Abiel Smith School was originally constructed in 1835. It was the school for African-American children. The building today is where the Museum of African-American History houses its exhibit. Now, the Abiel Smith School, when it opens very quickly, it is apparent that it is inferior to other white schools in the area. It is overcrowded, underfunded, and at one point in time had a racist white headmaster in charge of it. Obviously not a place where you want to be sending your children and again, an example of that treatment of second-class citizens. You're going to see this community coming together to organize against the ABL Smith School. And one of the key leaders of that organization, or that effort to organize, was a man by the name of William Cooper Nell. Now, William Cooper Nell, he grew up on this north slope of Beacon Hill. Um, he actually lived in this home. This is a, a current picture of the house, which actually is located right across the street from the ABL Smith School. And Nell, from a very young age, 
was determined to try to right this wrong. And we know this because we have a journal entry from him. And in that journal, he stated, God helping me, I can do the best to hasten the day when the color of the skin is no barrier to equal school rights. Proved to be very prophetic words because through Nell's activism, the community coming together, men and women, and through petitions, boycotts of the ABL Smith School, talking to government officials, and above all else, truly persistent agitation, you actually see Massachusetts passing laws desegregating its public schools and in the legal segregation of its public schools in 1854. Major civil rights victory, but not all that this community is able to accomplish. Railroads were integrated in 1843. By the time Black men could vote, serve on juries. That was in 1860. And even laws that banned interracial marriage were overturned in 1843. These are major civil rights achievements. And it's only one and a half percent of the city's entire population creating this change. But their activism was just not limited to fighting for civil rights. It very much extended into the fight against the institution of slavery. Well, you have this civil rights struggle going on in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s, you also have this community becoming home to freedom seekers. Major spot on the Underground Railroad, major stop on the Underground Railroad. In fact, this home that William Cooper Nell lived in was an Underground Railroad safe house. Because of the success of people escaping from the institution of slavery and coming to places like Boston, in 1850, at, you know, a major request of the slaveholding South as a part of what is known as the Compromise of 1850, which allowed California to join the Union as a free state, the government passes the 1850 Fugitive Slave Law. Now, the Fugitive Slave Law allowed for United States Marshals to come into any northern state or territory and essentially kidnap people, re-enslaving them. What the law also stated was that if you were caught with a freedom seeker in your home, you spent six months in prison, and you paid a $1,000 fine. $1,000 in 1850 is roughly equivalent to about $35,000 in today's money. Obviously not a small fee. You also be deputized on the spot. What that meant is if you, know, you were walking around, say, Boston Common, minding your own business, and a federal marshal came up to you and said, I need you to help me apprehend this person, you didn't do it, you could go to jail. jail. The law naturally scares a lot of people within that Beacon Hill community. What it also does, as you can see here by this sign, or this broadside, I should say, that we've appeared throughout the neighborhood, it creates a much more militant attitude, a much more militant approach to resisting the institution of slavery. And no better embodiment of that militancy than two people by the name of Lewis and Harriet Hayden. Now, the Haydens were not born in Boston. They were born enslaved in Kentucky. They would escape enslavement with Harriet's young son, Joseph, make their way north. They settled in Canada, Detroit, but then eventually Boston. They moved to this home, which still stands today. It is a private residence. It's a stop on the Black Heritage Trail tour. And the Haydens turned this home into one of the most well-known Underground Railroad safe houses in the city. They harbored dozens, if not hundreds of people inside this home. And we know this not just through memoirs, recollections, you know, 30 years later, hearsay little snippets here and there. We actually know this through well-documented primary source evidence, um, which can allow us to rightfully claim that this home, this nickname and earned in the 19th century, was a temple of refuge. In an organization that really helped us and helps us study the Underground Railroad in Boston today is a group called the Boston Vigilance Committee. Now, what you're looking at here is actually a page from their account book, which is interesting because this is an organization that you can think of as sort of like a financial backbone of the Underground Railroad in Boston, you know, reimbursing people for harboring individuals inside their home. I don't really know why they did this, but they kept meticulous financial records, names, dates, 
addresses. And it really helps us paint a good picture of what the Underground Railroad would have looked like in this city. And through this, you know, you see Lewis Hayden's name appearing again and again. And again. Now, with all the people that the Haydens are harboring, it makes sense, and it's fitting, that you're going to have a lot of really powerful and inspiring stories. One I always like to share is a story two people named William and Ellen Craft. And William and Ellen Craft, they were enslaved in Macon, Georgia, very far away from Boston or, you know, a free state for that matter. When they determined that it was time to escape, they did so in a very unique way. Ellen Craft was very light-skinned and could actually pass as white. So when they determined it was time to escape, Ellen Craft cut her hair, dressed herself up in men's clothing, as you can see by this image here, and pretended to be the sick white slave master of her husband, William. And rather than utilizing the Underground Railroad, William and Ellen Craft purchased train tickets, got on a train, and took that train north to freedom. Obviously a very bold move. In order to pull that off, some serious precautions had to be taken. Um, Ellen Craft, as you can see here, had her arm in a sling. She did not know how to read and write. She was pretending to be a white man. She'd likely know how to write. So by putting her arm in a sling, she didn't have to sign any documentation proving who she was. Doesn't show it here in this image, but they also put bandages around her face, hiding her lack of beard. And again, as a young African-American woman betraying a white man, the less she spoke, the better off she'd be. They make it north. And they actually come to Boston. They stay at this home, the Haydens. They join anti-slavery lecture circuits. They go around and they start telling their story. And as you can imagine, this has the makings of this great Hollywood drama, right? And the story spreads further south where their former enslavers here where they're staying. They escape in December of 1848. A couple years later, 1850, that fugitive slave law is passed, and two slave catchers are dispatched to Boston to arrest the crafts. The story may have grown over time, but as some tell it, um, one night, slave catchers appear at this front door, walk up those steps, start pounding on that door, yelling for Lewis Hayden to release the crafts. Hayden calmly answers the door. Some can't say lit torch, some say candle, but regardless, he tells the slave catchers very calmly that if you want to take one more step towards my home, you can, but I will drop this lit torch. It doesn't seem like a big deal with the house being made of brick, but when he opens the door a little bit wider, he reveals that he actually has multiple cakes of gunpowder sitting by his front steps, quite literally willing to blow up half the block to ensure that these slave catchers are not successful. And obviously that does not happen. Um, the... Slave catchers are chased away, the William and, and William and Ellen Craft are able to escape. They will go to England, where they stay until the end of the American Civil War. Afterwards, they come back to the United States when slavery has been abolished. They write their memoirs, running a thousand miles to freedom. And they actually open up a school to teach newly freed men, women, and children what they themselves had been denied in their youth. And that's thanks to the Haydens, that's thanks to that organization here in Boston, this North Slope of Beacon Hill community. But their activism was not just limited to preventing people from being arrested, it extended to when people were actually arrested, which was the case in February of 1851, the arrest of Shadrach Minkins. Shadrach Minkins was a freedom seeker who escaped from Virginia, stowed away on a ship, made his way to Boston, was working at a coffee shop when former enslavers heard where he was staying, came to that coffee shop, actually sat down, ordered coffee from him, were able to identify him, and then arrested him. Brought him to this courthouse, which no longer stands today, but is located roughly by government center. Shadrach is going to be returned to the institution of slavery, not a doubt in his mind. However, abolitionists, Lewis Hayden leading the way, heard about this. We'll march down to that courthouse, and in broad daylight, they break inside, overpower the guards, grab Shadrach, make him physically spring him from prison, carry him down to that Beacon Hill neighborhood where he stays in Lewis Hayden's neighbor's attic for a couple of hours until Hayden is able to get a carriage. Once he gets that carriage, put Shadrach in it, get him out of town. Five days later, he's in Montreal, Canada, a free man. He would remain free 
Mercury for the rest of his life. Now, this happened in broad daylight. People saw this, and others were actually arrested, including Lewis Hayden. What you're looking at here is actually an indictment for Lewis Hayden's arrest. But it was a, during his trial, it was a hung jury, mistrial. Not a single person would end up going to jail for the rescue of Shadrach Minkins. And the federal government, with the passage of the Fugitive Slave Law, wants to make an example out of Boston. They want to enforce this law. And they get their chance three years later in 1854 for the arrest of Anthony Burns. Burns, similar to Shadrach, stowed away on a ship, made his way north from Virginia. Working in Boston, he is identified and arrested, brought to that same courthouse. As you can see on the left here, this is a broadside that would have appeared all throughout the city calling for a meeting at Faneuil Hall. 5,000 people are estimated to have shown up at this meeting to try to pack inside to hear what is going to happen to Burns. There were several other who were not there. Who was Hayden in tow. And they decided that rather than speak out against the arrest of Anthony Burns, they were going to take action. And in fact, this meeting at Faneuil Hall dissolved into chaos when word came that the courthouse was under attack. Abolitionists had armed themselves with axes, brick bats, and a large piece of wood to use as a makeshift battering ram. They go up to the door, they start pounding on it, trying to break inside. They're able to breach the door. When they get in, though, there are dozens of marshals waiting for them. The marshals and the abolitionists engage in melee. Bricks are thrown, glass is shattering, clubs are being swung, a shot is fired, and a federal marshal by the name of James Batchelder is actually killed. And while all this is going on, a federal marshal named Watson Freeman sends a telegram telegraph to the President of the United States, Franklin Pierce, explaining what has just transpired in Boston. Pierce essentially responds, do whatever you have to do to uphold the law. So now hundreds of soldiers, federal soldiers, Marines from the Charlestown Navy Yard are dispatched to this courthouse. It's surrounded, martial laws put in place, Anthony Burns is not going to be rescued. June 2nd, Friday morning, 1854, Anthony Burns is marched out of that courthouse, surrounded by hundreds of armed federal soldiers. But while there are hundreds of soldiers, there's an estimated 50,000 people in the streets protesting. Now, put that number in context, the population of Boston at the time period is about 110,000. Obviously, not everyone at this protest is going to be from the city, but still, numerically, half of Boston's population turned out to line this half-mile stretch of State Street on a Friday morning to protest the return of a 20-year-old man back to the institution of slavery. To give you a better visual, on the right is a photograph of State Street I took it a couple of years ago. On the left, a sketch of this return, the rendition of Anthony Burns. Now, Burns is in the middle there. You can see him, um, top hat on here, soldiers lining the streets protesters on the roofs back here. Again, hard to see, but it's actually a cannon that is being towed. It's estimated it cost the taxpayers $40,000 in 1854 to return more men to the institution of slavery. This is going to have consequences, not only in Boston, but for Burns himself. Bostonians do not forget about Burns when he is sent back to Virginia. A minister by the name of Leonard Grimes is actually able to spearhead an effort to have Anthony Burns' freedom purchased, which he does successfully about a year later. You also have Massachusetts passing what were known as very strict or stringent personal liberty laws, which were put in place in the aftermath of Burns to prevent enforcement of the Fugitive Slave Law in the state. Not a single person would be returned to the institution of slavery under the Fugitive Slave Law out of Massachusetts after Anthony Burns. It's a flashpoint moment, one that changes minds. But it could not have happened without the efforts of the men and women on the North Slope of Beacon Hill community. And that community, maybe, again, not very large, but very powerful, 
the center of that community, the African Meeting House. And the African Meeting House is uh, considered by historians to be the oldest still standing African Baptist church in the country today. It's been in the same location since 1806. It's a more modern image of it. It's not currently owned by the Museum of African American History. You can visit it, see the beautifully restored interior, the interior restored to as it looked in 1855. Now, this is a space that was an African Baptist church, but it was a community center. People were married here, listened to concerts, attended lectures, debated social issues, and even went to school in the basement before the construction of the Abiel Smith School. Titans of the anti-slavery movement spoke here, including William Lloyd Garrison and none other than Frederick Douglass. The meeting house also served as a key recruitment station for the 54th Massachusetts during the American Civil War. The 54th, as you can see here, a uh, captured beautiful monument, which has recently been restored, which is definitely worth checking out if you have the time, right across the street from the Massachusetts State House. The 54th Massachusetts was one of the first African American regiments or group of soldiers to fight for the Union Army during the Civil War. It's going to be recruited not just in Boston, not just in Massachusetts, but all over the northern United States. So many men try to sign up and fight in this historic unit, they actually have to turn away about a third of the volunteers. But these men, they're not just fighting to maintain union. They're not just fighting the Confederacy. They're fighting racial prejudice and segregation within their own ranks, a two-fronted war effort. See here, it says they're going to be paid $13 a month, and they get their first paychecks and only paid $7. They boycott pay for 18 months until they are paid equally to white soldiers. They have to fight in segregated units. They have to be led by white officers. But despite all of this, these men still served, and they served admirably. They will help turn public opinion around regarding African-American men fighting in the Civil War. And they do this because of their bravery and discipline in battle, courage under fire. They do so at the Battle of Fort Wagner. Now, Wagner is located in the harbor of Charleston, South Carolina. It's right by where Fort Sumter is. Um, unfortunately, where Wagner was has been um, eroded away. Uh, erosion has taken the, the area where the fort was. But the fort was very well defended. The only way to get at it was a very narrow strip of beach. As you can see here by this map, water, swamp, and sand. Whoever led that charge was going to sustain heavy casualties as one, only one regiment at a time could attack. 54th not only led the charge at Wagner, they volunteered to do it. They volunteered because they saw it as a chance, an opportunity to prove themselves in combat, prove that they are a valuable asset to the Union Army. That is why on July 18th, 1863, you have some 600 members of the 54th Massachusetts leading the charge into Wagner. I wish I had a storybook ending for you here, but unfortunately that is not how history played out. Out of the 600 men in charge of the fort, 272 of them were killed, wounded, captured, and missing. This is a tactical loss. The Union Army does not take the fort this day. But despite it being a tactical loss, it still proved nonetheless to be a victory in other ways. A lot of press of this battle, a lot of positive coverage is given to these men commemorating their bravery, talking up their courage. You actually see the recruitment of African-American soldiers in the Union Army rising after this. By the end of the Civil War, over 180,000 African-American men will join the Union Army. That makes up a tenth of the entire Union Army, over four years of fighting. And these men were only allowed to fight for two years. Black men were not allowed to join. United States Army until the Emancipation Proclamation in um, January 1863. Black men made up 10 percent of the army, but only one percent of the North's entire population. Without these men, the Union could not have a victorious. And again, a lot of that can be thanked to the 54th Massachusetts the trendsetters, one of the first regiments to do this. Now, in 1883, Massachusetts commissioned a sculptor by the name of Augustus St. Gaudens to create a monument to honor the 54th. The monument took him 14 years to complete. 
a lot of attention to detail, as you can see by this image. And what you're looking at here is one of my favorite photographs. It's from the dedication ceremony, 1897 Memorial Day. By all accounts, pretty cold and rainy day. When you look at this image, this photograph, there's some of these men, older, taking off their cats. And those uniforms don't fit as well as they once did. These, this is an image of veterans of the 54th, 55th, and 5th Cavalry, all African-American regiments and units fighting for the state of Massachusetts during the Civil War, able to attend the ceremony for the monument dedicated to their sacrifice. One of my favorite parts about this photograph is you see there's an American flag. That is an American flag being held by a man named William Carney. Carney was at the Battle of Fort Wagner. And during the battle, he saw that a man who was carrying the flag of the regiment was killed. Carney knew the importance of the flag to the men. So he put his own personal safety aside, ran into a hail of gunfire, and retrieved it. Saved it. But he was shot multiple times doing so. He survived his wounds. And 34 years after the battle, was able to march back up the street he had gone down three decades prior. So look at that one. It was dedicated, again, to his and his men's sacrifice. For that effort, Carney became the first African-American to receive the Congressional Medal of Honor. It's one of the highest military awards given here in the United States. In conclusion, I want to wrap up with a quote from none other than Frederick Douglass. I think Douglass does a very good job here um, with this quote, summarizing the role of Massachusetts leading up to the Civil War. It's given in a speech known as Men of Color Talks. It's a very famous speech in which he is uh, going around stumping for this regiment, trying to get people to sign up and fight. He's almost answering in this the rhetorical question of why Massachusetts? Why should we, why should we come to Massachusetts to join this regiment? What he says, you can read, you can get at the throat of treason and slavery through the state of Massachusetts. She was the first in the War of Independence, first to break the chains of her slaves, first to make the black man equal before the law, first to admit colored children to her common schools. I need not add more. Massachusetts now welcomes you, two arms, as soldiers. And with that, I'll stop sharing my screen. And I'm more than happy to take any questions. So, Sean, uh, great job. Um, we've got uh, yeah, lots of time for questions, which is good. Uh, so, Carol says that she recommends the book Master Slave Husband Wife by uh, Elon Wu. Uh, I'll uh, spell that. Uh, that is a book about uh, Ellen and William Craft. So I will copy and paste that into the chat. Uh, Pamela says, thank you. Uh, she enjoyed the presentation. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks, is the Nell House now privately owned? Yes, so that's a great question. Um, so the Nell House is, like many residences in the Black Heritage Trail, are privately owned. Um, Beacon Hill is a historically protected neighborhood, so people can't really change the exterior of the homes. Um, so you walk around, you get a real feel for what the old neighborhood would have looked like, but they are private residences. So you can't go inside any of the spaces except for the um, Museum of African American History, which owns the African Meeting House, as well as the uh, building that was the Abiel Smith School. Um, so every, everything else, again, is, is a private residence. Uh, Judith says, uh, thank you. This was very interesting. Lori would like to know, are walking tours conducted year round? Great question. So they are not conducted year round. Um, we do them roughly from Memorial Day to Halloween in person. Um, but what we do have is over the last year, uh, the National Park Service has a free app for your smartphone. Uh, and we have created uh, a couple different audio tours. So we have a free audio tour of the Black Heritage Trail. We have an audio tour that explores Underground Railroad safe houses and sites in Boston. And then we also have an audio tour for the Freedom Trail and a couple audio tours um, that, that are specific with the, the Freedom Trail um, as well. Uh, for those who are interested too, I did want to drop in the chat. Um, we did create during the pandemic 
uh, a part of our website strictly dedicated to Underground Railroad activity and resources. Uh, so this has a couple different interactive features, including a map that highlights sites directly related to the Underground Railroad, um, detailed story maps that explore journeys of freedom seekers, and then a couple of videos and specific articles on people and, and you know organizations. Um, so if you're interested in Underground Railroad resources, that's a that's a great uh, part of our website to check out. Yeah, that's great, Sean. I'll make sure to include that link in the uh, follow-up email. Uh, Amy says, wonderful presentation. Thanks so much. Ron says, great job. I knew little of this, uh, so thank you so much. Uh, I think you answered Pamela's question about the app for the walking tour. Uh, Gwendolyn wants to know, how do you go about scheduling a walking tour? Great question. Yeah, so we we haven't put it up yet, um, but our walking tours are available for, uh, they're free, um, and we we get that you can book them through our website on a, an Eventbrite page. That is not live yet. Um, we haven't totally ironed out exactly what the schedule is looking like. We're still we're still in the middle of our, our seasonal hiring, but we will have those up. Um, probably by next month. So they are, again, they are free. Um, right now, at least we'll be running Wednesday through Sunday, um, likely at 10 o'clock and one o'clock are the public tours. Um, our website also has contact information. Um, if you're interested, if you have a larger group, I'm gonna put this in the chat, um, which is our general inbox that you can email as well. Excellent. Um, lots of questions. Let me uh, jump back to the questions. And Sean, when you uh, type uh, something into the chat, if you could make sure. Uh, uh, yep. you, uh, <laughs> yeah, I did host I some panels. Yep. Time. Yeah, if you could just do it, make sure it's to everyone. You got uh, that. And not just that panelists. Right yeah, yeah. I Sorry about that. <laughs> No problem. Um, so uh, Evan and Nancy have similar questions. Uh, where are the photos of the documents presented to view? Yeah, it's a great question. So they're in a couple different places. Um, if you're looking specifically for the Boston Vigilance Committee, um, I can pull that up for you. It's a uh, there's a really great website um, called archive.org that houses a lot of these documents that we use, um, which is which is pretty great. But let me see if I can find it. But yeah, so that you can find um, again on archive.org. And as we can go through questions, I will also pull up where that came from. Sure. Uh, Martha asks, are there any descendants of the 54th living in the Boston area? and or involved in the Heritage Trail? Yeah, so there are a couple. Um, when we did the rededication of the Shaw Memorial recently, on uh, June of last year, there was a list of some descendants that did come, um, not necessarily living on Beacon Hill or anything like that, but uh, you know, it is a not a very large, but the people who are, you know, um, that know they are descendants are, very proud of that fact and, and, and are, you know, involved in, in maintaining and sharing the history. An uh, anonymous attendee wants to know how many sites are on the trail? Great question. Um, I think total there are 12. Um, and then there's like pockets of sub, so like, there's Smith Court residences, which is like several homes that are in there, but they're all kind of clumped together right in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Gwendolyn says, thank you, a great job, very informative. Um, an anonymous attendee asks, what was the name of the first African-American who was the recipient of the Congressional Medal of Honor? Can, can you repeat that from uh, before? Uh, William Carney. William Carney. Uh, so William Carney, he was likely someone who escaped from enslavement in Virginia and then made his way north and actually lived in New Bedford, um, where is, which is where he signed up for the um, 54th Massachusetts. 
Yeah, as an aside, a couple of years ago, pre-COVID, uh, the Tewksbury Library hosted an actor named Bruce Chester, uh, who did a sort of a living history performance, a reenactment of uh, Sergeant uh, William Harvey Carney. Um, so uh, highly recommend Bruce as a performer. Um, let me see, Roderick says, to what uses is the meeting house put today? So how is the meeting house used today? So it's used for mostly, um, mostly his like guided tours of the building, but it also, you know, people can use it for weddings, functions, um, school groups often will go to it. So it's, it's a, uh, it's a building that, you know, for the most part is used for historical purposes, but does serve some of its, you know, kind of original uses and functions, which is, which is pretty great. So folks, we're going to start wrapping up. If you have any more questions or comments, now is the time. Uh, Jacqueline says on the vigilance committee page that you showed, why was, uh, what was the column with money for? Great question. So the column with money was for reimbursements or payments paid out. So like, for example, let's say Lewis Hayden harbored people inside of his home um, and provided them with a couple of train tickets to go out to Worcester to another anti-slavery community. The money that you see in the column on the far right side would be money that could be paid to Lewis Hayden, reimbursing him for buying those train tickets. Now, what you also do have in there, so there's like the you know reimbursing, and then there's also donations. Um, well, a key solicitor of donations is a man named Austin Bierce, who would go around and collect money for this organization, and you know then that would be entered as a separate entry as well. So, kind of the coming and going of the money, who you know was donating, who was you know doing the Underground Railroad activity, being reimbursed for it. So, those are the kind of two main functions of the money column. And then here is a link to that account book. Um, and I did send it to everyone this time. <laughs> uh, Mary says, thank you for an, an enlightening and straightforward presentation. I can't wait to hit the trail with nieces and nephews in June. Uh, we'll definitely be downloading the tour information. Uh, Russell says, nice presentation. Uh, Christina says, great info. Susan says, thank you. Martha says, thank you for a great presentation. I learned a lot. Uh, an anonymous attendee says, I did a free walking tour from the Boston Common covering part of this. Uh, are there any other opportunities to walk the history? Um, so I, I, maybe that's, so I'm not entirely sure what the attendee is referring to, but um, it, I guess in addition to your uh, walking trails um, or guided tours, uh, Sean, are there any other entities uh, doing what you're doing? Um, yeah, so I'd say, you know, our partners, the Museum of African American History, specifically if you're interested in 19th century, you know, abolition, um, anti-slavery, uh, you know, work, that, that, that that's a really great place to go. They do, they're open six days a week, you just have to book a ticket online, and you, when you get there, you know, they get a guided tour, they get an exhibit, um, you get to go into the meeting house, and they're open year round. So that that's the, that's the other key organization that I would look to. Um, if you if you are interested, and I'll draw again, I'll draw the sure. link to their website in the chat. Okay, um, and then sort of a random question, but you uh, used the phrase broadsides a couple of times. Is that just another name for signs and posters? Yeah, so it's like yeah. it's a nineteenth century term where it's like a broadside. You can kind of think of it as like if you walk around and see like a poster taped to a lamp post or a wall yeah. or something like that that that's that's what a broadside is gotcha i'm familiar with the broadside of the barn uh, phrase um so christine says um let me see here so beth asks how much time do you recommend someone should plan on devoting for the walking tour um 90 i would say if you're going to do it yourself probably like an hour and 15 minutes um you know it's about a mile walking it, it is up and over beacon hill and each stop has, uh, if you do the audio portion of it, has um, like three to five minutes of, you know, uh, an exploration of the site. So I'd say probably like an hour and 15 minutes. You know, when we do a guided walking to ourselves, we say 90. And Christine, I think might finish us off here. Uh, are you familiar with the book, Sarah's Long Walk, 
uh, his court case for integrating the public school system, a, a famous African-American lawyer uh, who lost the case. Are you familiar with that story? Yeah, so essentially um, a five-year-old girl named Sarah Roberts who lived outside of the Beacon Hill neighborhood uh, had to walk past like five white schools to get to the Abel Smith School. Her father, Benjamin Roberts, um, it actually ends up suing the city to try to integrate public education. And <laughs> he hires one of the first African-American attorneys in Massachusetts, a man named Robert Morris, to represent his daughter. Ro Morris actually works with Charles Sumner, um, who is a senator from Massachusetts, abolitionist, and unfortunately most famously known for being beaten near to death on the Senate floor with a cane by Preston Brooks. Uh, representative from South Carolina, but they bring this case to court. They they are not successful in the case, as, as um, the, the user pointed out. Um, this took place in 1849, uh, but the case, the argument from the case, the, the foundation of it was actually used by Thurgood Marshall, um, you know, nearly 100 years later in the um, Brown versus Board of Education case. Gotcha, gotcha. All right, we, we managed to not stump Sean. He had all the answers. So uh, folks, let's give Sean a big virtual round of applause. Uh, folks, look for an email from me later today with a uh, feedback survey and a link to this recording and information about some other upcoming virtual programs as part of this series. Uh, Sean, did you have any last words for the audience before we wrap up? Uh, nope. Feel free to look at our website if you're interested in any information, um, you know, tours and that sort of thing. And uh, again, thank you all very much for taking the time out of your day. Great. Well, thank you so much, Sean. And thank you to all the libraries uh, for partnering with Tewksbury. I will acknowledge all the libraries in the uh, follow up email I sent. So thank you all so much. And I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Thanks again. Bye.